Okay, thanks for joining me, everyone. Um, we're going to start the session with just sharing some stories about how we've moved from TESOL into instructional design. Um, my name is Sharon Chaden Glass. I'm currently an instructional media designer for Sinclair Community College in Dayton, Ohio. Um, I have not always done that. In fact, the past 13 years of my life, I taught in higher education um, and specifically in intensive English programs in the Ohio area. So kind of like, where, where did I start thinking about doing this? Around 2016 to 2018, um, if you've been in higher education in the United States, you kind of saw the drop in enrollment happening. Um, but there were other factors that kind of led me to seeking out other employment. Um, I, had, I had our second baby, I was, and, and I had a preschooler, and I was exhausted, quite frankly. Um, I had a real growing lack of autonomy in my classroom for all kinds of reasons. And um, I was really feeling a real lack of professional support for me as a professional. So I was like, you know, at some point, I just decided, decided that I had to start choosing myself over helping everyone else in the world. As much as I love helping people, I was really, really suffering um, mentally and emotionally. So um, in that two year time period, I started getting really interested in video editing and my husband and I started a YouTube channel and um, that kind of sparked my creativity and gave me a little bit of joy back like, here, let me do something that's just completely different than what I'm doing with TESOL. And um, it was that initial desire to just try something new that kind of exploded out this other, I wonder what else I could do. If I can do that, I wonder how I can grow in this other area. Um, so in 2018, I started working on a graduate certificate at the university that I was teaching at. So I got um, my tuition waived for that. And I was so very grateful for that because a traditional um, path with uh, actual courses you sign up for and you turn things in ended up being what I really needed to stick with learning something. And, and it wasn't necessarily that I needed the instructor's feedback, although it was helpful. It was more of um, accountability for me to just sit down and and read and study and learn and apply so that was super helpful for me um, and I did that when I had a one-year-old and a four-year-old and it was bananas and I did a lot of work from four to seven in the morning on Saturdays and Sundays but I got it done so um, in April 2019 I started job searching and um, it took I, I got started getting interviews right away um, but I didn't get a job right away. Um, the first interview that I had was with Cengage um, for a learning designer position. And I got that interview because I connected with the learning design manager on LinkedIn. And she was really, um, I don't know, I guess she liked go-getters and I thought, what else have I got to lose? Um, I did, I was not offered the job. Um, but uh, it's, it's really, it really turned out to be a better thing for me anyway, because that job was really product focused. It was about creating um, digital materials for books, which sounded cool, um, but was really removed even further from the learner than it was an instructional um, So uh, my husband uh, was like wholeheartedly supportive of me doing this and he really helped me through the whole imposter syndrome that a lot of us feel like, oh, but I'm not like, I didn't go to school for that. And he, he calls me sweets and he's like, sweets, you've got to stop saying that. You know, you have the skill set. Go sell the skill set in a way that they want to hear. And I'm like, all right, well, that's not lying. It's just selling myself um, using words that they need to hear to understand what I do. Um, so, um, if you have your microphones on, can you make sure your microphone is muted? Um, so what I learned from that whole process was, um, that it's really important that the TESOL degree will give you the ability to, um, it gives you the ability to lean into your adult learning theory. So if you've taught adults, lean on that in your interview and talk about how you can take a skill and break it apart um, into components and then design materials that teach that one skill. 
um, I think that that was what got me past that got me through the first three interviews at Cengage, but it didn't ultimately get the job, but it did show them all oh, this. She knows what she's talking about. Um, let's see what else did I want to mention. Um, my, the job that I have currently is actually in media production for Sinclair Community College. And I, 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 when I asked later on, after I got comfortable with my new coworkers, I was like, hey, like, why did I get this job? They were like, it was your video portfolio. You knew how to make videos and you showed us that you could make them. And I was like, oh, awesome. Okay, so I thought that might have been it. But because I'd done the work ahead of time and showed them like, if you hire me, this is what you can get. I think that was such a huge selling point um, in knowing that they weren't taking that big of a risk on having to train me for so long. Um, so um, I think that's all I wanted to say because I wanna make sure that other people have time to talk. Just one more thing. Um, after I got that job and I started telling people that I was changing jobs, now people knew, oh, she's in instructional design now, right? So I started talking about myself differently and when the pandemic started, like I started getting emails from people like, oh my God, can you help me? And I was like, I have a job, but I mean, I'll talk to you and see if I know anyone else. So I talked to, I didn't even know I was being interviewed. I was in a Zoom call and they were like, what would you in this situation? What would you do? And I'm like, I don't know, I'd do this or this. What do you need? And, and at the end of the call, I realized I was being interviewed for this job. I thought I was going to be recommending someone else. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm like, what do you need? And they're like, we just need someone to be available to talk to our faculty members and answer questions. I was like, I can totally do that. You need help with your LMS? I can do that. I could do that all day long. And, and they were very flexible on the hours. And I was like, sign me up. And the, the pay was, you know, pretty decent for it being a part-time job. So um, that just, and it also kind of made me feel better about the pan that I was, you know, doing something to help people who are in a tough position in the pandemic. So um, that was what I had to say. I'm going to pass it off to one of the other people that um, I have here to speak to you. Um, Kara or Erica, does either of you want to go next? <laughs> okay, let me see. Kara and I, Karen, I would do the waiting game forever, I think. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. My name is Erica Zimmer. Um, and to sum up where I am, so I was, uh, I did, so I have a master's in TESOL and I've worked in TESOL for, um, that was my first career in education, basically. Um, and I, I've taught abroad, I've taught uh, domestically in that, I've taught adults, I've taught higher ed, I've taught children, I've did it all. <laughs> um, and then I've always been a techie. I love, um, I've always loved integrating technology into my uh, curriculum. And I always felt like technology was a way to open the door to a whole other world that oftentimes my student didn't have access to. Um, and there's a lot of great free educational material out there. So I was that person that, you know, before we had one-on-one, -on -one, I set up, like I convinced the IT team to set up a a mini computer lab in my room <laughs> somehow with computer parts because I wanted kids to blog and things like that. But so about five years ago, I made the switch into uh, pursuing educational technology. And that's where I kind of started to fall into the instructional design world. And I became an educational technologist for a school district and basically coaching teachers on how to implement technology into the curriculum and designing trainings for them on how to do that. Um, and I had to go back to school to get my uh, an, uh, second licensure for public school in educational technology. So I started taking coursework and ended up enrolling in a master's program to get another master's in um, teaching with technology and this program happened to have a strong focus on instructional design. And that's, that's where I was like, Oh my God, this is like this whole other field. I had no idea that existed. And I love the e-learning. I love designing e-learning. I love playing with all those tools. That is where I want to be. I want to be an e-learn e-learning instructional designer. Um, and so my, uh, and 
and I still work in public education right now until I find that that beautiful golden e-learning job that I want. Um, and I really want to take the leap as far from education <laughs> that I can get, I think. So I'm going, I'm going straight for like corporate instructional design. And I, um, you know, I, I have been approached by some like universities because universities are really desperate for instructional designers right now. And I just realized like for my happiness, that's not where I would be happy. Like, I'm ready for that other chapter in my life and I'm trying to get away from education. Um, and so, and I actually really want to go in the freelance route. I really want to be a freelancer. I want to take contracts. I want to, um, but I'm also willing to take that job that pays, if it pays right, I will not do the freelance thing. And if it is a good fit for me, I will not do the freelance thing. Or if I'll take it for a little while with the hopes that in a few years, I will be freelancing. Um, so that's basically where I'm at right now. I'm in the journey and hopefully I can learn from you and share my journey and we can support each other through this. Awesome, thank you. Um, Kara or Leslie? Hi everybody, welcome. Um, so my name is Kara North and I am not a TESOL professional, so I'm sorry about that, but um, I am an accidental instructional designer. So don't feel bad if you've never heard of instructional design or you're looking to pivot. I totally didn't know what it was either. So my story is I actually went to school to be a journalist and I was really interested in broadcasting, video production, really enjoyed it, but then the economy like crashed. <laughs> so I graduated undergrad in, in the recession and I couldn't find a job anywhere. So I did what most people my age did. I moved back home in with my parents and um, just very desperate to find a job. They actually still had a newspaper subscription and the newspaper one day said that they had open interviews for a call center. And I'm of the belief that anything beats zero dollars an hour. And so I went in and I walked out with a job. And let me tell you, no kid uh, straight out of undergrad wants to work in a call center. So it was not fun. But after being there for about two or three months, they said, hmm, we actually have a position we'd like to promote you into, which was a quality analyst role. And a very small piece of that was training new folks about the quality procedures of the company. And I didn't know what I was doing. I'm sure it was horrible, but I remember after the first training I did, I like went home and I'm not kidding you. My parents will validate this. I told them I wanted to do this the rest of my life. I just knew that that was it for me and that was my bliss. So um, I ended up, I stayed there for about another year. And then at the same time I was working there, there was a company you may have heard of it called Amazon, um, mm -hmm. was actually in our, our um, where I was uh, working at at the time. And they built this huge customer service center. And so when it opened, all of our best people went in droves. And so then they had a nice recruiting bonus. People were like, oh, you all need a trainer. There's a great one at our center. And so I ended up working at Amazon. And so um, I did Kindle training for a while. And then one day I was just, you know, again, instructor led, not instruction, well, instructional design to it a little bit, but the way that they did it was we actually had everything created by the instructional design team. And I was the one that was kind of delivering it, right? So one day I asked my manager, I was like, who writes this? Because there's a lot of gaps. I see a lot of issues. He's like, oh, that's the instructional design team. And we're going to have an opening here. Is that something you'd like to do? And I said, sure. So that's how I became an instructional designer at Amazon. <laughs> so I uh, did that for, for a little while. And then I ended up falling in love with somebody in a different state um, and then had the discussion of am I moving or are you moving so I moved to Columbus Ohio and um, I had a couple different ideas of where I wanted to work but um, Sharon your story really touched me because I have a very similar background I didn't know this was a thing and so I ended up taking a job at the Ohio State University um, to get a free education. Um, so I uh, got my master's done very quickly. I asked if they also pay for a PhD and they said yes. So I'm finishing up my, my PhD right now in learning technologies. And so I was there for seven years. And so I have about seven years of experience of higher ed ID and about five years of corporate beforehand. But um, I, in the middle of the pandemic, I decided that um, I was 
needed to go back to corporate because that's where my heart was. So um, I ended up uh, getting a couple different job offers in the middle of everything. And now I'm a training operations manager for a large semiconductor manufacturing company. So um, that's my, my story. So I look, I hate talking about myself. So I'm really excited to meet you all and learn more about, about your journeys. Anything I can do to help you, I'm more than happy to. I'll jump okay. in. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name's Leslie, so uh, I'll try to go quickly here. Um, I was, uh, I didn't get a degree in TESOL at all, but I basically learned from the School of Life and uh, in 2007 decided I was going to move to South Korea and I just uh, became an English teacher there um, without really knowing what I was doing, but you know, <laughs> I, I um, stay there for eight years. So, you know, eight years of experience by the end of that, I was pretty solid in, in my understanding of how to, you know, design a, a English language curriculum and teach to uh, uh, elementary students mostly. So, um, but eight years is a long time. So, you know, I started to get homesick, uh, decided I needed to transition back to the States. But um, so my plan for transitioning is while I was still in Korea the last last year and a half, I was still there, I got my elementary education credential. So thinking that I would transition into being a full-time elementary educator once I got back to the States. So that plan worked for a couple of years, but after a couple of years of being a third grade uh, teacher, I, you know, it had been 10 years in education at that point and I was kind of burnt out and, um, and realized, you know, it wasn't a personality fit for me at that point. I, I'm a very introverted person and, you know, leading a classroom of 25 kids all day, every day. And like, not, I mean, anyone who's a teacher knows, you know, you barely have time to go to the bathroom. You barely have time to eat. Like, it's just, it's a lifestyle. And if, if that's not something that you're really passionate about, it can burn you out really fast. So, um, so then just happenstance, I moved from, when I finished my second year as a third grade teacher in LA, I moved to Minnesota to be closer to family and um, had, to, had to decide, am I going to stay in, in elementary education? Because I would have to get recertified in Minnesota. Um, and I think at that point I was like, well, this is my chance to figure something else out. So I didn't know instructional design right away. I did know I liked educational technology. I used a lot of it in my classroom. I used um, you know, Khan Academy, code.org, Scratch, like a lot of different online um, learning management systems, but uh, I didn't know right away. So when I got to Minnesota, I started working at a law firm basically as a case manager. So I was on the phone all day, similar to a call center, just helping clients. Um, and similar to like what Kara said, I realized, oh man, there's a big gap in knowledge here for, you know, case managers trying to interact with clients, but they don't know anything about social security disability. So, cause that's not something people know about. So I uh, designed, well, I was already studying instructional design by that point, but started designing training for that law firm. And, they, and then, you know, and I just went with it and I said, okay, this is something that I can do. I know I can do it full time. I know it's not gonna burn me out or exhaust me emotionally and mentally the way that being a teacher has so uh that's kind of it so i'm i'm finishing up my master's now and i'm looking into hopefully doing something freelance similar to erica because i just again being an introvert i kind of like the idea of working from home and working on my own schedule and just having that kind of freedom it's scary at the same time but you know <laughs> so that's that's me in a nutshell I was going to say uh, we so could rock, paper, is... scissors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we could also do that. <laughs> you know, go ahead. Uh, okay, yeah. No, my name is Christina. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm from Maryland, and I have been teaching in Austria the past six years. Um, my bachelor was in music, actually. Um, I started learning German, Italian, and French as an opera singer in undergrad, and I thought, I don't want to take out 50 grand for grad school, so I'll go to Europe because I also love German. So my way of getting there was through English teaching. And um, so that's what brought me to Austria was an English teaching assistantship with the Fulbright Commission. 
and they placed me in Linz, Austria, and um, there's a lot of business there. There's a lot of international business there, and I was at a um, college for teacher education, and so I was placed in higher ed, and I ended up loving it. I was assisting professors um, and also assisting um, the professional development department with in-service teacher trainings. And because of my background in music, I was with a lot of um, teachers in elementary and middle school uh, for that. And the professional development department was doing a lot of e-learning trainings as well. Um, so because I was in higher ed, e-learning was already a thing. And, um, and then I wanted to stay, sort of change my career to professional development and teaching. And uh, so then the past four years, I was uh, two universities and at an elementary school and a middle school. So every day I was somewhere different with a new group of learners, which I loved. Um, and every school that I was at was implementing e-training um, and the professional development team also loves having native speakers and teachers um, around the world to give trainings and they, they just, kind of went through me to get to know other teachers. Um, so if anyone's interested, let me know <laughs> if you want to give an e-learning training. Um, and so I kind of fell into that as well. And when I, then I thought, okay, if I'm going to pursue TESOL and higher ed, then I'm going to do a master. And so I'm finishing my master in TESOL at UMBC. And that program was very, very heavy um, at the time in instructional systems de design. So some of the classes overlapped with the ISD program and you were able to earn a graduate certificate in that. So I jumped the chance on that um, and I got my certification in that and that helped broaden my skill set as far as ISD is concerned. Um, and I think UMBC's program in particular, they allow you to specialize in certain areas. So I was even considering maybe going into ISD and specializing into TESOL and developing e-learning for that. So I think that was really valuable to know that that existed and certain ISD programs allow you to specialize in one area, whether it be TESOL or something else. Um, so now I just relocated back to um, central Pennsylvania where my Austrian husband is and um, trying to break out into the world as well and network with other TESOL and ISD people. So um, I am also applying my skill set in different ways and different wording, as Sharon had mentioned, with adult learning theories and um, yeah, all of those keywords that are really in a resume, I think really help. And I've gotten a few interviews so far and I've been in the process of, of those interview processes. So I'm looking forward to meeting everyone and sharing experiences um, because I think our skill set is really valuable and there's a lot of opportunity for us to grow in the field. So thank you. Thanks, Christina. Um, and uh, Kelly, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, OK, so I missed the very beginning, Sharon. So I just want to make sure what we're using this space for is like an introduction of ourselves. Yeah. How we got into TESOL and instructional design. Yeah, exactly. Just kind of what is in, in five minutes or less, what's been your experience? You got it. Yeah. Um, so I have a master's in TESOL. And my graduating um, project, my graduate culminating project, we didn't call it a thesis, was in SLIFE, which if you're a little rusty in TESOL, that's students with limited or interrupted formal education. And so doing the research in that project really is what brought about an interest in adult education principles, which then brought about an interest in instructional design. So it all kind of, it looks like on paper, I knew what I was doing, I didn't. I just kind of followed the breadcrumbs, right? I just um, followed my likes and my interests and thankfully it turned out in a way that you can make money off of it. Um, so I was an adjunct for a while in TESOL and um, you know, adjunct is part-time faculty at a university in higher ed. And they say, you know, you adjunct for two years and then you'll get a full-time job. This economy, this market, that didn't really happen. So I started to think, okay, well, I like the idea of instructional design. Let's start looking into it. And so I started um, initially on like those job bidding sites like Upwork. And um, they usually say in the job description if they're looking for um, like entry level skills so that they can pay the least or if they're looking for 
higher level skills so that they can pay more and know that they'll get a good product. Um, and so that's how I kind of started and which I will say is a great way to build a portfolio and get paid for it. Usually you have to build a portfolio and it's just there as your example of the things that you can do and you never get paid for it. So it's time that you just have to volunteer towards getting a job, hopefully someday. But doing those little jobs um, from the, those bidding sites is a good way to get a little bit of money and build a, a portfolio. Um, and then I have, Sharon, I have two other things that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, I don't know if this is the right time or if maybe it can fit in a little later. You I wanted can do to, it, go ahead. Okay. I wanted to echo what you were saying in the beginning about um, you are, by the nature of having a background in TESOL, you are really an expert in teaching and learning. And that's not something that I really interpreted. I have a lot of imposter syndrome for myself. So like even when on this call, when she's like, Kelly, I'm scrolling through, like, is there another Kelly? Could it be somebody else? That's, that's not, it's not me, right? Um, or when she sent this message, like, me? You want me to be? Okay. Um, and so you have to work with subject matter experts. They are experts in their subject matter. They are not experts in teaching and learning. You are. And we're all degreed people, right? Like we have a bachelor's, we have master's, some of us are working on a PhD. We value that piece of paper that validates who we are, who we think we are, who we want to be, the job we want, that sort of thing. And so having a TESOL paper, you might be tempted to say, oh, I really need that ID paper though. Like I'm not actually gonna be an ID. I'm not really gonna be successful until I have it. I'm here to say that I don't think that that's true. If you look at most ID job postings, the requirements are a degree in ID or related field. As far as I'm concerned, this is a related field. You have a background in teaching and learning and you can bring that into um, the, the work, the TESOL person and the SME, in my opinion, create this symbiotic relationship where you need each other to turn out something that's really high quality. And then the last thing I wanted to say is that back to portfolios, um, you need a portfolio to get work. You need work to get a portfolio, right? It's like this cycle and you have to find your way through it. I will say that if you're trying to build a portfolio, I think that there are three main trajectories that you can go into instructional design, corporate work, higher ed work, and freelance work. And then I wrote um, some notes to myself about the types of things that you would want in a portfolio based on where you want to end up. So if you want a corporate ID job, those are kind of broken down into HR categories. Like you want to work for human resources and um, professional development or the trainings that you have to, everybody has to do. If you've ever had a corporate job, you have to do annual trainings. Um, so most corporate ID jobs are housed in HR because they are those sorts of trainings that you're creating. So you could, if you want that sort of job, create a portfolio that talks about the ADA, the Americans for Disabilities Act, right? That sort of thing. And then the other part of corporate jobs is tech writing. So you could start getting some experience or building a portfolio in that area if you're wanting to go into corporate. If you wanted to go into higher ed, um, also, hang on, I'm going to back up. So creating a portfolio, by that I mean you want to create um, courses or mini courses or things that show that you have the tech background. And so one of those is you can do um, Storyline 360. You can do a free trial for 30 days. And if you really plan it out within that 30 days, you can get a lot of things for a portfolio. And so that's when I'm saying these things. If you want this job, make a portfolio for this. Do a 30 day free trial. Try to build as many mini courses as you can. And then that becomes your portfolio. So corporate. Higher ed, I would say try to do something for a learning management system. And I know those are kind of um, like there's a free canvas. I think there's a free version of Blackboard, but you don't have all the functionality. Um, so you could do a mini course for your portfolio that compares and contrasts the learning management systems, right? That shows that you, you can research those because they have that not behind a paywall. And then that shows that you're familiar with multiple LMSs. So that's um, one option. And then another thing for a higher ed portfolio would be anything about accessibility. If you look um, into the ADA or you look into the principles of poor, 
um, P-O-U-R. If you Google that, you'll get result and know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, if you build mini courses in those areas, a higher ed um, company or a higher ed hiring committee is going to be like, yes, that's what I'm looking for. And then the last one is freelance. And the good thing about freelance is that you can kind of do whatever you want. You can find something that you're interested in, whatever background or topic you are particularly interested in. Because if you're looking for freelance work, they just want to know that you can do it. They don't really care about the topic. So making a mini course on any topic and then also video production is good for any of them. And there are free video production things. Like if you have a Mac, you can use iMovie. I'm pretty sure there's a Microsoft equivalent. Um, and then there's a website called Screencast-O-Matic, which is a really silly name, but it's free for up to 15 minutes and you can record your screen. You can have it record the video of you and your screen at the same time. And then you can dump that over into iMovie and make um, a free video production. Um. What questions do you guys have that, you know, me or maybe someone else can answer because I'm definitely not the expert in everything. What are the best keywords to put on your resume? Ah, adult learning theory. I'd say I, that's a huge one. Yeah, I literally Googled, this is how I did it. I literally Googled uh, instructional design um, top keywords or something like that. And there's websites that will show you and it gives you like the top 10 or more. And I went through them all and just was like, you know, just make sure you're not lying, but like, oh yeah, I do do that in some format. I do do that. And, and just make sure they're like in your resume somehow or on your LinkedIn. LinkedIn profiles are really important. I discovered too. So mm -hmm. <laughs> make sure you're a solid LinkedIn profile. I think also on Microsoft Word, um, when you're typing up your resume, sometimes at least on mine, it will have a resume assistant pop up and it came out of nowhere. And when I'm typing in my, um, my job, it will give other responsibilities of other job descriptions for instructional design. And it will list like random keywords and phrases and responsibilities on at least the, the latest Microsoft Word uh, software. And that was really helpful for me as well um, when I was listing my skill set was this feature that is on Microsoft Word with Resume Assistant. Uh, there's actually a website. There's two websites. There's one called JobScan, but you have to pay for that. There's a free one called SkillSinker, and you input the job description, and then you upload your resume, and it will compare to see how many keywords you have, like what's the percentage of match. And so they recommend you have at least 80% match um, because of the ATS system. So if you're doing it through Teleo or Workday or one of those, you definitely would want to use something like that. So then you can cater your resume to the exact job description. That's super helpful. Thank you. So what was the name of it? Uh, SkillSinker. I'll put the link in the chat. Awesome. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, on a on a rating of one to 10 with 10 being most important, how would you rate um, having, you know, HTML skills, coding skills, because I have seen this in some of the ads. I think if you want to be an e-learning developer and work on the back end, um, that, that would be important, but there's plenty of positions that are not on the back end where it's, more of developing um, the, the structure and the plan and the storyboarding. Um, so I, if you're not, if you don't already know how to computer code and you don't, you're not necessarily interested in learning how to do it, don't do it. Just look for something that, I mean, really like life is too short, you know, do something that you enjoy doing, not something that you feel like you have to do because that's what the job is. Also, I just wanted to add that there's so many, even if you do want to be an e-learning developer, there's so many <clears throat> authoring tools coming out now that are like alternatives to even Storyline. Storyline, you don't necessarily need to know HTML, but maybe some JavaScript stuff. But um, 
so many alternatives coming out that are, you know, basically sim the user interface is like a Wix or like Canva where it's all web-based and it's just very intuitive and you're just point and click basically and stacking elements. And so you don't really need any HTML or CSS to do that kind of stuff. So some of like is easy is one that I can think of. Um, I can't think of any other off the top of my head, but you definitely, and it's going to just keep getting more and more like that. I think that their authoring tools are going to get easier and easier to use. So. Cause a lot of that backend stuff is being automated. It's the human creativity and the soft skills that um, are going to be the last things to be replaced by the robots. And I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> it is coming. So just be prepared. <laughs> Other questions? Um, I am curious to know how many people are uh, in this group is already in the instructional design field and how many people have no idea what's going on. <laughs> about it. No, it's just, uh, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. Um, so I think I can count on my hand. Um, so me, um, Christina, um, Leslie does some, Erica does some, um, Kara does some, uh, who am I missing that is currently doing instructional design. Kelly is also doing instructional design. Kelly, right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Kelly. I was That's okay. Um, and I know that there's a couple of you who are currently in school for instructional design or learning design. So some of you are finishing your degrees and getting ready to start. So yeah. That's awesome. Such a great job. It can I don't be have done. the job yet. <laughs> but yeah. it was good. <laughs> Yeah, it can totally be done. You know, one of that was kind of one of my big goals in doing this was to give other people the confidence to, if this is something that you want to do, just try. <laughs> you know, I am I am cheering you on because um, if if you really need a career change, if it would make you happier, I am so happy for you. I have one question. Um, would you recommend getting any type of uh, certificates or anything that would, uh, I guess, uh, help businesses feel more confident in your abilities if they see it on your resume? I mean, maybe it, it was helpful to me because I needed the accountability to actually go do the learning right. behind um, some of and learn some of the terminology within the field of instructional design and and help me build a portfolio like Kelly was talking about. Um, but you, you don't have to pay money um, to go back to school to do this. There are free courses that you can take on Coursera. LinkedIn Learning has courses. Um, edX has courses. So it's not necessary. It really isn't. Um, okay. you, yeah, there are other ways that you can learn it. And I think a lot of it really is just um, making sure, like Rebecca was saying earlier, that you put the keywords into your resume so that you don't get filtered out because the words that you are using that are actually the same thing are not the ones that the computer is recognizing. I, um, I did take an edX certificate course um, because I was dipping my toe in. That was my way of figuring out if this is a topic that I really do want to transition to or a field that I do want to transition to. Mm. So um, I did edX. I know I ended up doing the paid one because it rolled into um, the University of Maryland's master's tr real master's program. Um, mm. So I did it, but I know that you can audit edX courses and you don't necessarily have to pay for them. So you could essentially get the same, you know, dip in the pool and see if it's something you like but for free. And by the end of taking that edX, you have a, a little um, portfolio that you can then use for employing employee. There was a carryover question from our breakout session that I didn't get to. Um, so, and I would honestly like to open it up to everybody. It's what is the vocabulary that we should use in a portfolio to make it more neutral, right? Like, we may not know exactly if we want to be corporate or if we want to be higher ed. So if we're higher ed portfolio, we would call them students. We would say courses, we would say classes, that sort of thing. 
But if you don't know and you're just trying to keep it as neutral as possible, what language could you use or should you use? So I suggested um, quickly, because we were running out of time, but using learner versus employee versus student. Um, but then what do you call the course? It's training if it's corporate, it's a class or a course if it's higher ed. So what is some more neutral language that somebody could use to try to keep it um, neutral in their portfolio? Learning experience. That's it. I said learning opportunities and I could not think of learning experience. It is experience. Thank you. That's the one. And even digital learning experiences, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Good question. Facilitator. Oh, I like that charity. Modules instead of courses works too. Good, Leslie. Uh, I want to add something. Um, one thing that was useful for me when I was dipping my toes into ISD uh, with podcasts and following experts online was you don't have to have uh, software to create a portfolio. You can start with PowerPoint, for example. You can put quizzes into PowerPoint because assessment is such a big part of ISD. Um, and it's very difficult to actually put a quiz into PowerPoint. Um, and it's a good skill to have because you can build a portfolio using PowerPoint and it doesn't have to be through this fancy authoring software. Um, and I just think that's important to keep in mind as well as you already have those tools and to master those tools um, in other ways is, is still possible.